video. Audio in three, two, one, you're live. Welcome to the Jeremiah Show. I'm Kat, your host today. Uh, Jeremiah is here with me, as well as Dr. D, keeping the trains running on time and making Hello. sure we behave. Hello. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Doing great from, from kind of chilly Santa Barbara. Yeah, I love it. How's Austin, guys? It's gorgeous here. It's Go it's like LA here right now. <laughs> we you took our weather. Yes, we did. Yeah. Well, no, this is this is one of those things that Austin gets one week of Los Angeles weather a year, and it's traditionally the week of South by Southwest when everyone from Los Angeles is here. Yeah. They don't get the 104, 30 days in a row, 100% humidity. <laughs> Sweltering heat. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. We'll take it. Um, well, guys, you heard him talk, but you don't know who he is yet. Today, we're going to answer the question, who is Johnny Gowdy? I love it. His resume is long. His Wikipedia is like seven pages long. Um, but I don't want to just do that. Today, I want to go deeper because he is a true creative um, and just a create tour, constant mover, right? And I'm always so fascinated by people like him. So I wanted to have him on. Um, pushing play for the first time on a Johnny Gowdy album is like sitting in the dark, front row at fashion week. You don't know what's coming, <laughs> but with Johnny, each song that comes down that metaphorical runway is new and fresh and a surprise. And at the very same time, it just, as you hear, it just makes perfect sense. He has this way of like, completely surprising you, but also letting you keep one foot in like the world of just nostalgia. Um, I love the way his tone is unlike anything I've ever heard, the way he puts the song together um, and just those catchy melodies, dang it. I sing them constantly. I was singing them in the shower today. <laughs> <laughs> is true <laughs> Kat, Kat, you sure have a lot of shower references in this show <laughs> <laughs> i do because i love to play music in the shower and i love to sing it's like the only place that i feel comfortable singing <laughs> um but let me tell you a little bit about like just the nuts and bolts of who johnny gowdy is so um he is cuban american proud of it I love his big family that he loves and keeps so close to him. He is a singer. He is a songwriter, multi-instrumental. This guy, you guys, he plays like nine instruments. So like. Yeah, but not very well. <laughs> <laughs> like look at behind him. Go to his his uh, website and just look at like Here. the first picture. That's nine more than I play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is like all. Look Stuff at those guitars. Everywhere. It's insane. He's showing us around his uh, his house right now. And it's, yeah, yeah there's like recording things. It's insane. Um, yeah. And I pulled this from your website because I think it says it so well. So um, four decades, your career has spanned so far and you're not stopping. Your musical nope. experiences span the artistic gauntlet, which I love. And it includes being the front man of your namesake band called Gowdy. And that was with Electra Records. You're, uh, you were the guitarist, keyboardist, and vocalist um, for renowned touring acts like Ian Moore. I love Ian. So Me good. Too. Seen him live here in Austin. Uh, the Bodines, you are a songwriter working with the likes of Jane Weedlin, uh, Charlotte Caffey. Kathy Valentine's a good friend of yours. She's from the Go-Go's. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, your solo artist. And then you have the fun Skyrocket, which is like yeah. 70s covers, right? 70s? Yeah. yeah, 70s and 80s, but mostly 70s, yeah. Yeah, you, they are super fun to watch. So if you're ever... In, I don't know if you guys, you guys sometimes play outside of Texas, but. Oh yeah, we play outside, but usually not publicly. They're usually private or corporate private events shows. And weddings. Yeah. So if you ever get a chance to watch Skyrocket, they are a hoot, um, but I'm not done. In 2011, <laughs> that's 10 years ago, um, Johnny launched a podcast called How Did I Get Here? which has steadily become just an audio anthology for the music community, not only locally here in Austin, but globally. Um, in fact, I think you just got word today or recently that you're charting in Canada. 
Yeah, yesterday. Yeah, congrats. Yesterday. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. That was a really interesting thing to find. It was exciting, but also just weird. Yeah. Do you have a lot of Canadian friends? Um, I have, uh, I have had, uh, I think three Juno winners over the last two months. So Mm -hmm. maybe that might be it. They were pretty popular bands in Canada. Pushing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that you're making your way across the globe. I can see like a little cartoon (laughs) map of Johnny traveling and and making his little dash lines across the globe. Um, Because I think today you guys will learn when I finally let him speak um, (laughs) that he has a great sense of humor. Um, He's a great story storyteller. Um, And just the caliber of your guests on your show is just top notch. Um, So Welcome officially, Johnny. You may speak now. Welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was the nicest uh, thing I've heard in a long time. Well, well so I'm always here much. to tell you nice yeah. things. Now I only want Richard to ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm joking. Be careful I, what I, you I, ask for. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 only have, I only have one, and that's who cuts your hair, man? Uh. <laughs> a very wonderful hairstylist named Terry Ann. Who's and that's all I got. He's jealous yeah. because he, because he doesn't jealous. have any. <laughs> he doesn't have any. <laughs> he asks everybody that question. Who, how, how do you get here? Yeah. How do you get here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I feel like after that great intro cap that Johnny's too cool for me to even be in this room. Well, I might have to step out. So when yeah. I, I Can I stay, Johnny? The same thing too. I, don't, I, I was like, who is this guy? He's very cool. <laughs> he is very I'm, cool. I'm thank, you, thank you for making me seem cool. I know I'm so nervous. Yeah. And now Kat's going to grill you. She's going to grill you. Right, oh, this is now no. an interrogation. No. <laughs> I just want to hear stories. Um, let's take All it right. back, Johnny, because I... someone like you, I just feel like you have done so much and seriously, like the people that you have been associated with playing either, you know, playing with or bands that you've had, like the list is so long. So let's just kind of, let's just walk into the water before we jump in. Tell me how all this started for you. One of the things I love to know, like people like you that are just constant, just such creative people, you have so much to say is like, tell me what kind of kid were you tell me about the first time you realized you know you found music and paint the picture okay um as a kid like uh I have six brothers and sisters but I didn't have my first sibling till I was like 13 so I was like an I was an only child and uh my mom traveled a lot we lived in Mexico for a few years when I was a kid and stuff so I was very uh it's very kind of on my own, but also always had to make friends everywhere I went. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's kind of what informed my personality, you know, the having like meeting new people all the time and having to kind of like make friends out of them. But a lot of the creativity stuff came from just being alone. My mom was a creative person. You can see this painting behind me. She did that when she was pregnant with me. And, oh. uh, and I was just always drawing like, you know, I, my mom wanted me to play sports. I played sports and, and I was terrible. And my coaches hated me because I was, you know, daydreaming off in the backfield or whatever. And <laughs> you know, whatever sport it was or position, I don't even know. But um, then she wanted me to take guitar lessons. I did that for about a year and I didn't like it. And then uh, uh, when I was 13, I, I went to Miami for the summer. And that was when my, my first sibling was born. And... Uh, and then uh, I went to see Cheap Trick with like these uh, these clients that my or partners or something that my dad had from Venezuela. But we used to always spend the summers together somehow when I was a kid, this family and ours. And uh, they were in Miami visiting and, and the daughter, the family brought a girl that was a few years older than me. And uh, we all went to go see Cheap Trick. And there was something about the, the show that I did notice that there was this. Uh, first of all, I love their music. Like Cheap Trick means a lot to me musically. And, and uh, uh, when I saw them, there was this communication that they had with each other that was kind of like if you've ever seen the Beatle movie Help, where the Beatles all live in one house together. Like that's kind of what I wanted to grow up and do, like just live with my friends in a house. Mm-hmm. And everyone was super weird. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. And so I, I saw this communication and stuff between these guys that I, I'll never forget. I remember uh, them looking at each other and laughing about something. And I wished that I knew what it was and that I was part of it, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then as we were leaving, the girl that, that came from Venezuela to Miami uh, told me that she would hook up with Robin Zander because he played guitar and, uh, <laughs> and, and sang. And so that was the first time I was able to tell someone that I played guitar. And also I realized it was an in with girls. And so like I came back to Texas, uh, you know, the next month and started my first band in at the beginning of eighth grade. And we started playing like people's parties and stuff. And so. Isn't that the reason that every young boy starts a band and picks up a guitar that, for the girls? <laughs> having done like, you know, over a thousand podcasts and being friends with so many musicians. Yes. I know a couple that are like, no, no, no. I was just really into violin. And I'm like, eh, you sure? But yeah. Yeah. It was for girls. It was like, you girls? know, at that age, you have no idea what the combination is for a girl to like you. And so then all of a sudden you see this thing and you're like, well, you know, if all I have to do is that, then it's also super awesome. You get to hang out with your friends and you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it's safe anyway. to say that there would be no music in the world if there weren't girls. <laughs> yeah. Well, made by men. And the, you know, the funny thing is, is that women have the exact opposite thing because they don't, it's weird. The reaction from men to women playing is a lot, different than I play with a lot of women I hang out with a lot of women and uh musicians and artists and they all have a terrible time meeting people (laughs) because guys don't respond in that way mostly to musicians maybe because they're intimidated I was gonna say I wonder if they're intimidated dude I've never dated a musician really is that by (laughs) choice yes (laughs) (laughs) yeah so let's just apologize to all those musician female musicians out there that that see this and hear this and want you so bad and they're just never no 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 i don't girls neglected by johnny yeah i don't know maybe i'm intimidated (laughs) yeah i don't know yeah maybe yeah maybe anyway you would be that's interesting that's what got me into it oh sorry that's what got me into it and then i had bands you know in high school and then I started playing with grownups when I was 16. Well, that was and my I next I played question. in like a real band. Yeah. Yeah. So Carol King, you know, um, her guitarist, Mark, uh, Mark Hallman. Mark Hallman. Yeah. yeah he had a also, side project. Also, he produced a couple of records. Yes. Yeah. I read that. But so, so how do you meet him? So after I, I that, that, like the fall of 1982, when I was in eighth grade, um, my mom had this really good friend who lived in Austin and married this guy. And then I had the, the incredible fortune of, uh, in fact, I sent him a drunk text the other night and I think it's true. I believe that outside of my parents, he's the most significant human in my life, which is weird. Anyway, there's a great Mark? Doc, there's, Mark Hallman. Yeah, there's a yeah. great documentary about him called The Shopkeeper and you can watch it on Amazon Prime. It's really good. Okay. You can see what kind of person he is. Anyway, um, he, we met. And he took a shine to me and I was just fat infatuated with him because he, I met him on a Friday, but on the Tuesday he had been on David Letterman playing with Carol King. And it was like, I met a guy from the TV. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I could ask him any question I wanted. He took me to get my first electric guitar. He would take me around. Like he toured with Dan Fogelberg a couple years later. And oh. when I got out of school in the summer, uh, I went out to Colorado and got to go to Red Rocks to a couple of shows with them and hang out with Dan Fogelberg and all those people and all these great, you know, side musicians that played with them too. It was amazing. Yeah. He's an amazing, amazing person. Anyway, so he, I was his roadie cat oh. and I was so bad. <laughs> like my mom and I moved to Austin and he was like, all right, well, you start out, you can be my roadie guy. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I swear to God, I was so bad that that was the only choice he had was to put me in his band. Because oh at least I could do that. And I had leather pants. So. And you're 16. Are you not 16. going to school this time? No, no, I was going to school. How? You know, <laughs> I was at school with Ian Moore then. There was Did a bunch of us that ended up, yeah, yeah. We were, we were bros back then. Oh my God. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, yeah, I went to school. I went to school to meet chicks, but like, I don't. I don't. <laughs> Oh my God! I was I was never a, a great student until after I left. After I was out of school, was when I all of a sudden became interested in learning things. Learning, same, yeah. same though. I think that's true for a lot of us. Yeah, so, I felt I felt like it was holding me back from the life, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and, sorry. And so at sixteen, at this point, you know, yeah. you're three years in. You now you can. Is it fair to say you can play the guitar like really well? Like, no, yeah. I was good. I mean, I wasn't amazing, but I was good. Yeah. Good I enough. knew my, I, I knew, uh, I knew how to do my job. Like I was given parts to play and I learned them and I played them. Right. You just, you yeah. just sucked at being a, a roadie. Yes. Very, <laughs> very, very bad. Was it the attention yeah. to detail and the, and the follow through? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I don't know. I just couldn't believe I was like, I felt like the help and I wanted to be like the dude. It's pretty like- rough that yeah, yeah. yeah so the ego started kicking in yeah my ego was so huge when I was that young it's unbelievable really yeah there's this great manager here named uh Kevin Womack and uh he's managed those lonely boys and all kinds of like big bands the the Winter Brothers and I took a meeting with him I knew someone that knew him when I was 16 and I was like I got I got to get in and see this guy so like all right so I go in there and I have this meeting with him I actually did a podcast with him and I asked him to recount that story to me because the way I remember it is so embarrassing. It's unbelievable. (laughs) I just went into his office and I remember I was wearing leather pants, uh, like a tank top and like a pink jacket. And I might've kept my sunglasses on the whole time. Probably a good idea. (laughs) And I basically, I basically was like, Hey baby, I'm here. Let's do it. (laughs) And he was like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, I don't know, but let's get out there and do it. And he was like, do you have any songs? And I was like, no. And he was like, well, man, here's the deal. You got to do stuff and then come back. And so his, his recollection, and he's a very kind man and has always been very, very supportive and sweet to me. Um, his, his, his recollection was that I had, I had so much ambition that he, he wanted to always follow me. Which was awesome. kind. I'm sure he thought I was an idiot, but. And had anyway. you, did you, did you start to write at that, at that point? When, no. when did you start writing? No, late in 1985, my mom died like right before my, or around my 17th birthday. And um, I moved to Miami to live with my dad. And that was kind of when I touched in on, uh, it's kind of maintained who I am as a songwriter and how I write is uh, I kind of went into self-analysis. Like I didn't really have anyone to talk to about that. Like, you know, my dad's like this old Latin dude didn't want to, you know, what are you crying for? You know, like he'd yell at me and like, you know, not in a, not in a horrible way, but that's just what his culture and, and that thing is, was like, Hey, she died now. Now let's not talk about it and move on kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I, I obsessively began writing songs and wrote like 150 songs like in eight months. I was writing songs every single day, sometimes two a day. And it was, it, they were kind of like these, they teetered between sort of these uh, stories where I would try and write some story, but the ones that really kind of like seemed to have more gravitas were sort of these uh songs that delve into like self-analysis and 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 figuring out what you're feeling why you're feeling it and what you can do about it Mm -hmm. and I think that that's sort of like how I trained uh how I trained as a songwriter myself you know what I mean it's it's my songs a lot of them are very very personal Mm -hmm. and uh I don't really think about it when I'm writing them because I'll stop myself I mean I've stopped myself from writing you can't like you can't say that so I try really hard to distance myself from what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of it works out sub, like the ideas and the emotions come from my subconscious and sort of like flow through my ability to write. But that's, it all started through that, like sort okay. of dealing with grief. Yeah, I want to talk more about this because uh, we need to take a break and I, this is a okay. good spot to do it. So um, Jeremiah, we're going to go out with one of my favorite songs, not my top, 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 tippy top favorite, 
but it is like my second favorite. Uh, so Jeremiah, take us out with that, and then we will come back and pick up where we left off. Well, I, I just want to tease all the listeners. Your very, very tippy top favorite, as you describe it, is at the end of the show, we are going to play the ent- your cat's favorite tippy top Johnny Goody song. <laughs> Uh, a county song. Sorry. Uh, at sorry, the very, very end. Sorry. I, I, I have, to, I have to mess up with the name every time. It's just yeah. part of my thing. I apologize. Um, so well, yeah, we're going to listen to everyone's got something. Johnny, could you tell us a little bit about the song? Um, uh, my friend, Jamie Harris, who's an amazing singer songwriter. You guys should get her on your show. Uh, she came over one day and was like, Hey, I have this idea for a chorus. And then we wrote the rest of the song together. Yes. Um, I, and, uh, it was, it, I identified with it and, uh, it was something that we both identified with the, the lyrics of the chorus. And, uh, we wrote it pretty quickly. But I do remember this weird thing was I'd never seen anybody drink so much coffee. <laughs> like I made her coffee and she was like, this is real. She had like six cups of coffee <laughs> while we were writing the song. And I was like, dude, you're going to die. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, and it, it, I ended up making this record with this wonderful man named Scrappy Judd Newcomb in this great band. Uh, we got to record it at the church house and at the Congress house, the place owned by Mark Hallman. And also he mixed it. Yeah. I love, I love the, I love her, her voice is beautiful. And now that I know that she had six cups of coffee and, and ca- it still came out so beautifully. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So we're going to take it a break. The song would be a lot faster. So. <laughs> <You're right>. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take it a break right now with Johnny Gowdy's Everyone's Got Something. All right. Stay Sorry on. about that. We'll fix that. I just keep That's thinking, right, goody, goody, goody. We're talking to you. All right, here we go in three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back to the Jeremiah Show. We have a very special guest today in Austin, Texas with our the host of the show today. Kat is in Austin as well. We just came back with, I don't know how this rates on Kat's uh, tip, tippy, tippy list, but uh, we just came <laughs> back with Johnny Gowdy's You Can't Pretend Forever. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that's one of those super personal songs like that's basically uh, an extremely personal song. There is one funny thing about it. I mean, the lyrics explain what what I'm saying. So uh, it's kind of like my life in a song after staying up way too late one night. I wrote it all out and then I ended up writing the song later. But I remember at the end uh, when I was I recorded a demo of it. And uh, I did it at home by myself. And I got to the end. I kind of wanted to have something else at the end of the song. And uh, I didn't know. I wanted it to change like a little bit, you know, like give a whole new, like go to another level, like Mm -hmm. change the melody, but keep the riff going and have a whole new thing going. And I was obsessed with this Bobby Brown reality show at the time. And I was watching it all the time. And so I started singing this thing. It's all right. We love you, Whitney Houston. Yeah. And I just did it as like, a, like I'm, this is a placeholder. I'm going to sing something else when I write something. And like everyone in my band was like, dude, that is hilarious. You got to leave that in there. So I just did. And also I thought it made sense because a lot of times when I, when I go into a place where I reveal a lot of the inside of myself, the only thing I can do is come back with something completely absurd to sort of change the subject. Yeah. And so I felt like that was a good, a good thing for that. Yeah. Well, that actually is my, that is the tippy tippy favorite song. So, but that's cool. We can play it whenever we want. No, but. you know what? I, 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 we did two soundtracks. So can you pause for a second, Richard? We, uh, we did Johnny, we did two soundtracks uh, and then we switched that is Kat's favorite song. So we switched it to the end, but I'm looking oh, at my man. Spotify list with uh, not the, the correct, the new updated one. So I just screwed that up too. See, uh, we should catch it to keep me out of the show. Um, so that was a great, how should we do this, Richard? That was a great intro to the song, but it's the last song now. Richard did move it. We can, I, we can keep it. Can we, we can is there a way to put that description? No, how, what do we, how do we do that? I'd say we start over again with a segment. Oh, start okay. from the top. Johnny, do you mind doing it again? I'm sorry. No, no problem. Okay, the same we're, thing. We're, yeah, we're coming with Luna Park. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, Kat, yeah, yeah. Kat wanted to oh, move that good. song since it's her favorite to, to the full, play the full I thing just, at the end. Yeah, Actually, like Julia it. is the song we're coming back yeah. with. 
Julie. Julie. Oh, yeah. Everyone's yeah. got something for Julie. Okay, there we go out with. All right. Mm -hmm. Ready? We're starting from the top of this segment. In three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back to the Jeremiah Show. We have a very special guest from Austin, Texas. Johnny Goody and Kat uh, is the host today. She is in Austin, Texas as well. We just came back playing Julia from Johnny Goody. Johnny, uh, tell us just a little bit about that song. Love that song. Okay. So this song has an awesome story. I went, uh, I had this manager named Jed Malone. I had a, a whole crew of these Scottish managers and uh, they helped me start my band Gowdy. Like they liked my songs and me and what my, my bass player and I did. And we, we put together this band. But before the band was put together, I was offered this publishing, comp uh, publishing deal from this company. And the first thing they wanted to do was send me out to write with, uh, write with other songwriters. Uh, better songwriters, more experienced songwriters. So uh, one of my managers at the time was married to Jane Wheedland from the Go-Go's and we became friends when she was here during South by Southwest. And she came and sang on some demos of mine and we really, really, really hit it off. Like we started talking on the phone all the time and like uh, she had tons of advice and really like became like a big sister to me. So I flew out there and stayed with them and wrote with a lot of people, but wrote with Jane and Charlotte and uh, Charlotte Caffey from the Go-Go's and uh, Sky Kevin Hunter and a bunch of people. And uh, one night we all went out to this party. Do you guys remember that band School of Fish? Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a band in the 90s. Okay, so that guy from that band, Josh Clayton felt he had a, it was his best friend's birthday. And he invited like all of his friends, but all of his friends were like Lyle Workman from Bourgeois Tag and Colin Hay from Men at Work and like, you know, Jane and like all these people like, oh, Louise Goffin, like all that was just their friends. And they rented out this place that was called the Ash Grove in Santa Monica. And uh, and we all went out there and it was fantastic. And Colin Hay got up and did a few songs by himself. And I like my jaw was open. All the hair on my arms was standing up. Mm -hmm. I almost cried during this one song. And Jane was like, do you want to write with him while you're here? And I'm like, yeah. So she walks over to me and like, this is like for someone my age to watch Jane Wheedland from the Go-Go's walk up to Colin Hay from Men at Work is like MTV exploding in your face. Yeah. So she walks up to him and she goes, hey, this is my friend Johnny. He's here from Texas. He's really good. Oh, they, they had just met. They were just meeting for this. Like, hey, I'm Jane. Hey, I'm. I, like they knew who each other were, but I saw them meet in front of me, which is so weird too. Anyway, um, she goes, to, uh, this is my friend, John, he's from Texas. Do you, would you want to write with him while he's here for the next couple of weeks? And he goes, uh, no, but <laughs> if you, if you want to come out to my place in like Topanga or whatever tomorrow and listen to some new tunes, I'd be happy to hang out with you guys. So we went over there and me and he offered me and Jane this tea and we drank it. And when we left, she was like, I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> and I was like, dude, me too. So we went back to her house and I don't know if this is bad or good to say, but we took Valium and we drank these tall boys. And we went up to this space in the back of her, uh, in the back of her, in her backyard or whatever. And uh, in Burbank and, and, I had this, I had this song and it was this riff and it was the whole song, Julia, all of the music of it and all the melody and the Julia, sweet Julia. And I didn't have anything else. And so we're both lying like head to head on the ground. And she goes, let's make it about a necrophiliac. That's really sad because his girlfriend's dead. And I was like, wow, that is awesome. And we wrote the, all the lyrics in like five minutes. Can I laugh at that? I don't know if I can even yeah. laugh at that. <laughs> sure. Definitely. Wow. It's weird. But yeah. Yeah, that song has a great story. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. I also um, love that Colin Hay had no problem saying no. Like he was like, no. That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, right. What was the song by Colin that made you cry? Was it Waiting for My Real Life to Begin? Because that is like. No. Oh, sorry. No. Which one? Uh uh the soccer one uh soccer something feet oh to my brilliant feet oh i gotta listen yeah. to that again i'm sure yeah. i've heard it because i'm obsessed with colin hay he's amazing 
love him so much. Yeah. Um, so I think it's time to take another break and then we are going to jump back into, to what we started to talk about before, but I think we're going out with charmed, right? Jeremiah, mm-hmm. are we going out? <laughs> Cats took it over. <laughs> I love it. I'll just, yes. <laughs> Cats got it all right. <laughs> um, yeah. Charmed. Johnny Gowdy. That's it. That's it. All right. Stand by. You don't trust me anymore. In three, two, <laughs> one, you're live. Welcome what? back to the Jeremiah show. <laughs> I've taken this one. Sorry. I didn't know if you were going to go. Um, Jeremiah, what did we just hear? I've been fired from the show. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you want me to, do, to tell you? I do. I Luna, Luna Park. Awesome. Tell us about that one, Johnny. Um. All right. So... I was in Marfa on a vacation and I woke up one morning and I bought a New York Times and there was this amazing story in it about the man who invented the incubator. And uh, very quickly, his story was that there was no way to really finance the incubator because some hospitals at that time didn't believe in what he was doing. It was something they'd never seen before. So the only way for him to uh, financially keep it going was to put them in uh, the, the freak show at the carnival at Luna Park. And so you would pay money to see the little tiny babies in the incubators because it was freaky, but that was the way he was sustaining it financially. And what happened was the authorities thought he was profiting from, from the exploiting these poor, you know, premature babies. And so they shut him down. And he was vilified by the community. Mm-hmm. And then years and years later, they found all these people that he had saved that were now in like their 80s and 90s and stuff. And they all collectively told the story of how he was a hero and he was redeemed. And so I tore that, <laughs> I tore that article out. And I swear to God, I think I had 15 people. I'd be like, hey, man, read this. You want to write this song with me? No. I, for some reason, I didn't want to write it by myself because I didn't think I, had, I wanted to write it with someone that had a child. And so some friend of mine, Uh, This friend of mine, Stephen, had this idea for a television show and he got it funded. And so the television show was two songwriters meet at noon at the studio. They write a song from noon to three, take a break for an hour. A band shows up, you teach them a song and you record the song live and you're done by six. So in six hours, you write and record a song completely. And it's all filmed and stuff. It never got picked up, but we were the, the sort of the pilot, test pilot or whatever. And um I got with my friend, Michael Picasso, and when he showed up, I brought the article and he had had a son that was born prematurely. And so we wrote it really fast. I can't remember. I mean, it's all on film, (laughs) but uh, I I just remember we kind of, I mean, we really came up with the music right there on, on the spot and like the, you know, the chorus real fast. And like, we knew we wanted to call it Luna Park. I like to work a lot with titles. I play songwriting games with my friends and you get a title and you have, everybody writes a song to that title and the title has to be somewhere. But there's something about having somewhere to go when you sit down and write a song, you know what I mean? And there's a lot of great songwriters like Desmond Child and stuff like he just won't write a song without some kind of thing you're working towards to, or working towards, sorry. Yeah. Well, let's go back a little bit to what we kind of started talking about in that first, because you were, you were really talking about your mom. You were talking mm-hmm. about how that was the impetus for writing a boatload of songs that were really yeah. bardic and getting that out. You know, um, some say that it's, uh, that it's like the deepest forms of pain that often lend our, to growing to our higher selves. Where does that where do you find that space kind of landing in, in your music now, since you've had the, the gift Distance. of time passing yeah. and yeah. Like where's that pain kind of landed? Well, that particular pain luckily was, I mean, there's a, a, a at one point in my thirties, I got to that point where you get in your life where uh, you can't, you can't get away from it anymore. Yeah. It, you know, and so uh, I started going to therapy. So in a lot of that helped me a lot. And um, there they my mom was murdered and it was an unsolved case for like 23 years. 
And uh, there was a detective that came into my life uh, from the cold case unit. And I say he came into my life. He, he became, we became very, very close. And uh, he had had a similar experience when he was around the same age that I was. And uh, he found the guy that did it. And uh, that, that closed a lot of that discomfort mm -hmm. that I dealt, that I lived with on a daily basis. You know what I mean? Uh, and distance too, time, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, I but don't, I, can, I, mean, I I can still find things to feel terrible about though. <laughs> it's no worry. <laughs> yeah, we're big, you know, we are big advocates of mental health here on this show. And so Me too. I'm so glad that you, you know, found someone to, to really go to and, and that yeah. you felt comfortable and secure in doing that. So many people don't. So it's such a, such a strength to be able to do that. It makes my heart so happy that, that at least you had some closure to that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah. Um, it's time to go to another break. Jeremiah, what are we, what are we leaving to this time? It's all you. I'm just going to be quiet. I'm back. I'm back in the circle of trust. <laughs> back in the circle of trust. So uh, I face. really liked this song. It, it, it reminded me of a recent relationship. The word, almost every word in the song. Mm. This is "Leave It Alone" and "Boy in a Box." It's uh, Johnny Gowdy. We'll be right back. All right. Stand is by. your relationship with my ex-wife, dude? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. Oh, good, good lyrics. Really hit the nail Thanks, on the man. head. He hit it. Well All done, right. Johnny. Well done. Well done, Johnny. All right, here we go. <laughs> Three. You're gonna take two. us back. I'll bring I'm us back. Quiet. Oh, you want to take you back? Oh no, 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 I'm gonna be quiet. I thought you said. Did you say me or you? You, you, you. <laughs> Are you sure? Okay. All We're right. So here, polite here. Here we go. Three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back to the Cat Show. We've got Johnny Gowdy on this entire hour. He is joining us from Austin, Texas. It's so good to, to talk to him and hear the stories. And Cat, uh, uh, I feel like I'm a fly in the wall listening in on a very private conversation. It's it's Aww. wonderful. What a great interview. Uh, we just brought you back with Back of a Magazine. Oh, I, yeah. yeah. I love that I love that song. Why do you love great, that one? I don't know. It's, it's, it's real fun to play. Um, I have a lot of great stories about that song. I'm going to tell two really fast. One of them was there's a guy who I'm going to leave his name out because he doesn't, he doesn't drink anymore. And he would probably hate to be remembered as this, but he was at a, in a dark place. He was this Nashville dude. This is a really good friend of mine. He came in and we went to this place, Wero's here in Austin and had like just margarita after margarita and I, like left my car at the place and took a cab home kind of dinner. And uh, when I got home from this dinner, his anger and hatred towards every new band at the time had me like crying with laughter because he was he was just so brutal and hilarious that I was like, I've got to get some kind of like handle on this conversation and put it into a song. And I have to make it sound like the bands that he hates. So there was all these bands like the White Stripes and all this kind of stuff at the time. And I was like, I, I can just kind of get into like this dirty kind of like uh, New York Dolls vibe of a song, right? So, uh, <laughs> which he, he hated them too, uh, <laughs> like immensely. And uh, <laughs> the funniest thing is I sent him the song and he's like, this is the best song you ever wrote. <laughs> so I put that into the song, but when, when I recorded it, some friends of mine and I, this guy, Jeff Klein from this band, My Jerusalem, and, and one of my best friends, A.N.R. Peterson, one night were, were out and we went back to their place and it was like very late. And we decided that we were going to put an ad in the paper for a guitar player to see who would call. And so we got this, we got this online voicemail and we got a number for it. And we put this ad in the paper, like super famous band looking for, you know, awesome guitar player. And so all these, we'd say like, describe yourself in the thing. So these people would call and describe themselves in the messages and it was hilarious. So I had this CD of like 55 messages that we got from people. And there was one that was just hilarious is this guy saying his height and that he was good looking and all this stuff, he used to model and stuff like that. So I put it at the beginning and the end of the song. And so then I meet this guy 
And uh, he hires me to write the uh, a commercial for uh, a university here that changed its name in San Marcos from Southwest Texas to Texas State University. So I wrote this song, produced this thing, and afterwards we go out for a drink. And I'm finally getting to sit down and talk to this dude. And so he starts talking to me and he goes, uh, yeah, I was in this band tablet. And, uh, and you know, I mean, they got me in to play guitar and mostly it was because I used to model and I was like, and then his voice started sounding so familiar. And I was like, and I remember going like, all right, hey man, come out to my car with me right now. And you're either gonna love me or you're gonna hate me. And I played it for him. And at first I thought he was gonna punch me in the face. Like he turned bright red. I mean, he was really, really mad. And then he was super flattered. And now it's his favorite song. So I don't know what happened. But <laughs> he was really, really mad. Imagine that was such a small world where you're like, oh no. So oh, that, that, oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, the prank sometimes blows up in your face. It's <laughs> also a guy that made me a lot of money when I really needed it during that commercial. So I felt even twice as bad. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Karma. That's called karma. Karma. John. Terrible. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, I want to make sure we talk about Austin Music Foundation a little bit okay. and what you do for them. I'm curious, tell us what Austin Music Foundation is. Tell us what you do for them and kind of the overall goal for, for that foundation. Okay. Um, it started in 2002 and, uh, they started as a, as sort of an educational, uh, program for artists where you, they, they have uh, panels all the time on different things, uh, all aspects of the music business and stuff. And uh, they host mixers. They have, you know, they have events where speakers come and talk and they have consultations where people at no cost can sign up for these consultations and go in and speak to some kind of mentor kind of musician. Uh, and, and, and at no cost to them, so it's a nonprofit. And so, um, a few years ago, a friend of mine was running it and he kept on encouraging me to come to, and it's just like, it's honestly like a, maybe a third of a mile from my house. And so, uh, I went down there and I, I, I liked what they were doing and stuff. And I, I, I'd gone to a couple of things I'd been invited to by them. Uh, but I didn't really know what they did. And so he asked me if I wanted to be like a guest consultant, uh, uh, doing these consultations with with musicians trying to work it out and navigate these, you know, navigate the music scene here. Mm -hmm. And I started doing it and I really liked it and I liked everyone there. And then, you know, because of my show, they started asking me to like moderate panels and stuff for them. So I did. And then um, my, one of my best friends, Anar from Gaudi and before, like we've been friends for 32 years, best friends for 32 years. Um, he, he came in and started doing some guest consulting as he was playing bass for Kelly Clarkson and they were off the road and he was looking for different stuff to do. Mm -hmm. And we had told him, Hey, come on in. And so, uh, when we were there, we started, we would started going to like their, their meetings and brainstorming meetings. And we came up with a program, uh, me and him and this guy, Alex Vallejo, who we've been friends since the nineties. Um, we all came up with this program to pick out five to seven artists and kind of intensively put them through the, the paces and, and learning about the business, everything from accounting to uh, publishing, to record deals, to self-management, to booking, to you know publicity, to making records and doing the artistic stuff. And then we realized that our strengths really lied in the, in the creative parts of it. So a couple of years ago, we started another aspect of it where we make a record every year with them. Mm -hmm. And so now we've done two years of doing the record and four years of the program in whole. But uh, it's, it's a great resource for musicians here. And, and the reason why I wanted to get involved, like I told you about Mark Hallman, once I moved here and once I started playing with him, I was around all these amazing musicians that were a lot older than me and everybody took me under their wing and and you know especially like when, when I when I moved back here in like in one 
I lived in the Congress House Recording Studio, which is Holman's studio, uh, and for like two years. And through that, met all these people. And I, everyone was just very, had no problem doing the mentorship. And I thought that at this point in my life, it's probably time to give back and make sure that the next generations of musicians, you know, get get a hand up. Yeah. So you you like that, you know. I love it. Yeah, I, I, I know you do. Um, yeah. That's really cool. Is it is it just locally here in Austin or do they have they expanded a little bit or is it just for people here listening in Austin? Um, I mean, you can go there and find out about it. And, and I'm sure like, you know, everyone can watch those now that all the panels and stuff are online. So anyone yeah. all over the world can watch them. And uh, basically the consultations are sort of like Travis County. Mm -hmm. oriented I I don't remember anyone from any other town doing it but yeah I mean we focus on this specific scene yeah 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 Yeah. which is a really smart scene to focus on considering we're like the music aren't we the music capital of the world the live music capital the live okay yeah so is there a (laughs) is there a um is there a session and like a a piece on performing live like (laughs) well yeah there's a lot of that stuff yeah we we uh this year was tough on yeah. that level because we couldn't go see bands play but yeah usually like there was one guy one year that we that was basically the focus the whole time it was like dude <laughs> you're you're in front of people man <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i would suppose that that doesn't necessarily come naturally for everyone to we everyone. are not all johnny gowdy you know what i thank mean thank you that's yes. true you are such a natural. <laughs> <laughs> i just meant like thank god we're not all johnny gowdy oh. <laughs> this place would be a mess Oh, no. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about your podcast, too. Okay. Uh, you started that 10 years ago. Yeah, almost 10 years ago. I mean, does that just seem like just yesterday? And like, what was what gave you the bug in your ear to go, oh, I want to get in on this podcast thing? Uh, a few things. One of them was uh, uh, I remember I'm a, I'm a huge I love talk shows. And, and when I was a kid and I used to go visit my dad in Miami, uh, Larry King was on the radio there. And I remember listening to him every night and I just loved hearing people talk. And, uh, and then I remember I'm a huge Cherry Gross Fresh Air fan. And a friend of mine told me in like 2008 or nine or something, or maybe 2009, she was like, oh, did you hear the Fresh Air from the other day? And I was like, no, I wasn't in my car. And she's like, dude, you can just download this pod. She explained to me you could do that. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. And so I started being able to listen to that every day, but I didn't realize that there was original content to being made just, it wasn't just radio shows that you could listen to later on demand. It was like people were actually creating this content. And my cousin Eric at Christmas was like, oh, you don't, you don't listen to so-and-so? And I'm like, no. And he's like, all these comedians that I love had podcasts. And so I started listening to them and I, I realized, you know, scattered what was going on there in like the beginning of 2011, I, you know, really started, I, I spent, I spent eight months working on it before I released it. Cause it's one of those things you think you can do, but you can't, you know what I mean? Like you hear it and people make it sound so easy, but then when you try to do it, it, well, you guys all know. Well, uh, it's yeah. A little bit harder. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a little hard. bit harder. Jeremiah, let me so, it easy. Yeah. <laughs> So I spent months. I'm the only guy that's around. messed up the whole time. <laughs> Make it look easy. And maybe not today. <laughs> um, yeah, you make it look too easy. <laughs> yeah, knock um, it off. Almost like you're not yeah. showing up at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, uh, I, uh, I spent I spent months just talking on the microphones by myself. I would have friends come over and talk to me, and I sort of like realized. I can't, I mean, but even the first few, I remember when I first put it out, I have a really good friend here named Dale Dudley, who's a really big uh, morning DJ guy. And, uh, and I, I sent it to him and I was like, Hey, check this out. And he, you know, he totally railed me. <laughs> Basically I wasn't being myself. I was trying to be all NPR and I was talking like this on it. And I was oh. like, done. he was like, you're, that's the dumbest thing. He's like, you know, Use your personality like that. And he explained to me this one thing. He said, you don't want to make a show that people come to because of the guests that are on it. You want to come to a show to see what Johnny has to say to this person. 
Yeah. So, so that was huge. I like that. Yeah. And, and, uh, what was, there was another great piece of advice, uh, I got from Mark Marin that was, uh, don't like set up a thing that you can actually do commit to it and like put out your shows when you say you're putting them out and be consistent because if you don't take it seriously, no one else will. Yeah. So, yeah. Where did you get the name? How did I get, how did I get here? That is awesome. My friend Nakia was on the voice and I had once again, margaritas down the street (laughs) and, uh, and it was the first season of the voice and I was watching it. And I was thinking to myself, I just saw this guy at Saxon Club playing for 12 people last week. And now he's literally playing like to millions, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, all that's going through his head is like, how did I get here? And then all of a sudden I was like, whoa! <laughs> and I wrote it down. <laughs> and then I looked around and there weren't any shows. Unlike all the people that have sh- started shows called How Did I Get Here? After this, I actually made sure there was no other one. And... uh and so, yeah, that was the title. I thought it was you good. You blew your own mind. <laughs> you blew your own mind. Yeah. What? Well, I felt like I discovered gold. I did. Like, right when I had that name, I was like, oh, that is, if no one else has that, that is a good yeah. name for what this show could be. Well, I've got a show that I'm promoting right now. Uh, we did it with our last uh, guest who was on uh, America's Got Talent. And he is oh. going to help me to uh, co-produce this program. And it's called You Can Do What? Yeah. <laughs> it's got I a short, it. short life. I, I mean, a long life, a long life. <laughs> hey, I well, have a quick question for, uh, sorry, Kat, no, do you have? No, wanna... no, no, Just... please. I want to hear from you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, I want to know from both of you, you, you mentioned the morning DJ. That there's a friend of yours on the, on the local station there. Um, yeah. Popular station. And Quentin Tarantino's death proof is Jungle Julia. What what station does she the DJ is? Is that a real station in Austin, Texas? No, no, no. But Jungle Such Julia. Uh, you mean the girl in the the DJ that in Death Proof? Oh, Jungle no, 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 Julia. No, no, okay, okay. I was thinking of someone else, but my friend Julia Urban is Miss AK forty seven in. Uh, oh wow, Jackie Brown. Uh, and her her like all of her social media stuff is julia sweet julia and yes. she would always tell people that i wrote that song for her even quentin tarantino she told him that. <laughs> <laughs> about the necrophiliac yeah oh wow mm, julia's got a lot of guts she doesn't yeah. care julia she don't, don't care <laughs> julia don't care so jungle julia that was such an important question but she's not a real person or a dj or based on anyone that's not a radio station what is the radio station that that your friend uh klbj fm 93.7 it's the dudley and bob show dudley and bob Bob. hmm that's interesting (laughs) Um, for your your podcast i have a question no no disrespect to any guests that you have had prior but like what's your dream guest if you could like who who's like do you do you have it 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 changes all the time like i become obsessed with uh i have this uh, i love studio musicians Mm. guys that you know you might not know but if you were a kid growing up reading the back of records you knew them you know Mm -hmm. and i would see the same names and all these things and and so i do i spend about six months like in just complete love with somebody like Right now it's Steve Lukather. So I've reached out to his people uh, from Toto. Uh, and and that's, yeah. that's right now that's my, it changes all the time. Depends on, like, on what I'm, get your what I'm freaking out on. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Um, well, I know we both like uh, Anita Baker. So yes. maybe <laughs> she's, still alive. she's still alive, right? She's still alive. I've heard she's real mean though. Oh, I don't think she would be mean to you. I think you need to need to push for some Anita. Some Anita Baker. So much. (laughs) Anita Baker. Anita. Ouch. Get on. Yeah, there's there's people. There's people even like if someone said, do you want Dave Matthews on your show? I would totally say no. Isn't that weird? Yeah, Yeah. I don't don't like that. Jeremiah and I have a. He never did anything to me. 
I, we, we, love, we love Dave Matthews, don't we, Jeremy? Sorry, guys. Yeah, but I there was a time when I could not stand Dave Matthews and hated everybody that liked him for a long, yeah. long time. And then, Johnny, I uh, a, a friend of mine, a woman, a college student, asked me to help her wash her car. And she played Dave Matthews while we washed her car in my front yard. And I love Dave Matthews after that. <laughs> Did you date this girl? Yeah, I think it might have been the car washing that uh, really helped. So, uh, I, um, Kat, I know you're going to wind up here and you've got probably final questions. But you guys yeah. both mentioned Austin is the live music capital of the world. What is yes, the last is. year like? Uh, terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, things are opening up. I actually, uh, over this week, I've, I've been talking to three different venues because I'm going to be releasing singles. And I, I'm not, I'm, I'm super against hype right now because I feel like we live in this culture of like, big announcement coming soon. You know what I mean? And it, <laughs> yeah. it drives me nuts. So I figured I'm going to just drop singles like whenever I want and then be like, hey, there it is. Because I like, I like the thing to speak for itself. Mm -hmm. And uh and I'm just going to try that, like, I, you know, whatever. But I, I, it's coming back. Like, there have been some outside places that have done some stuff. There were some drive-in, there was a drive-in concert series this last fall that I went to one of them, and it was really great. Um, so at, the last year has been terrible. Uh, some mm -hmm. of our favorite places have closed down. Um, uh, other places are in trouble. Who knows how this is all going to work, but it's, 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 uh, things are opening back up now and things are coming back slowly. So hopefully this year will be better. Mm. Yeah, totally. Well, yeah. I think my final question to you is if you had to, or if you could time capsule yourself, what would you put in that time capsule? What best represents Johnny and what you would want people to find decades later and centuries later? Wow. Um, probably just my music and maybe the podcast too, but yeah. Yeah. What else? Do I, I guess so. My ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> ukulele. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess just my music mm. and all my cool guitars. By the I way, I don't know. Yeah. By the way, what you do is art. It would be classified as an artistic expression. And we yeah. found out on a previous program, there are no rules to art. So you can do whatever right. the hell you want. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. He's yeah, just received the Dr. D seal of approval. Richard's blessing. Not that it matters one iota. Yeah. You didn't say anything mean to me the whole time. That's true. I was waiting for it. <laughs> After we hang up, he will. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, he won't. No, I, don't he like won't. I don't like his hair. Richard. I don't like his hair, his lawn. We love you. Johnny, thank you so much for coming on and spending time. Yeah. I feel like we could spend literally hours and hours more. Maybe you and me need to go. You may, we Maybe we need to get a margarita and uh, go rogue. Yeah. Go rogue. <laughs> go rogue. <laughs> Come up with some new, some cool titles together. And maybe oh, we'll, we'll write a song uh, before we pass out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm a lightweight. <laughs> and oh, I love coffee. You can, I drink this size. It's a lot. <laughs> there you go. It's a lot oh, of wow. coffee. That's a big a cup of coffee. coffee. All right. Well, all thank, right. thank you guys so much for having me. Kat, thank you so much for listening to all this stuff. And, and uh, that was very flattering and everything. So thank well, you very, you very much. Know, I adore you. And I will be always the person you can call to remind you how wonderful you are. Uh, thank you. And speaking of great music, uh -huh. here is, you've been waiting for it the entire hour. I know Kat's been waiting. Woo! My favorite. You can't pretend forever. Johnny Gowdy. So good to have you. Communicate. Listen more and evolve. Everybody have a great week. Hey, we're clear.